You know, one of the things I really enjoy is strategic planning. My favorite part about building a new building or renovating our current facility, which we seem to do every few days, is the planning. I enjoy figuring out where rooms go, what walls we can move, what we can change. In the next few weeks, I'm going to talk to you about some major changes coming to our campus. We've been strategizing and thinking and praying about this more than a year. I, I enjoy that. That energizes me. I enjoy that kind of thinking. I, I love planning for a big day or for a new series, praying and thinking and throwing out ideas and brainstorming ways to communicate truth. But even with a lot of planning, there's still a degree of uncertainty. You, you look at blueprints, but you never really know what the building will look like till you see it. You study storyboards and scripts, but until you actually see it come together, you don't know how a series or an event will work. You plan for a big day or service, but you don't know exactly how it will turn out. Someone could miss their cue or say the wrong thing, or the Lord could direct us in a completely different way. Let me tell you, the Lord always has the right to interrupt. Uh, my older son, Pastor Tyler, and his wife, Emily, they're planners. And they research things online, talk to everyone they can. They carefully consider every option before they make a decision. And Tyler started that early, even as a little kid, for Christmases and birthdays. Isn't that a great picture? <laughs> Tyler would call his grandparents and call all his friends, and he would assign them what gift they should buy and bring to the party. <laughs> Tyler didn't care about surprises. He had a plan to get what he wanted and what he thought he needed. One year, Tyler assigned Cindy's parents to buy a game system. He assigned my parents to buy three games. He assigned Pastor Brian and Sherith to buy another game. Cindy's brother to buy the controller and all the accessories. He had a list for everyone. And about once a week, Tyler called everyone to make sure they were still on track. <laughs> they were buying what he assigned. No one was going rogue. And it worked. He got everything he wanted, the right things from the right people. He didn't care that there were no surprises. It's awesome when a plan comes together. When everything works out perfect, it's a great feeling when all your hard working and thinking and praying and studying and calling and assigning produces a big victory. It's not so awesome when your plans don't work out. I don't enjoy failure. I don't guess anyone does. We've made some awesome mistakes over the years. Some things we thought would be really cool weren't. Some of you remember back years ago on Halloween, we did something called Candy Factory. Yeah, worst thing we've ever done. Some speakers we thought would be inspiring were boring. Some songs we thought would just take a service over the top flopped. Some rooms we thought would be absolutely perfect weren't perfect at all. When an idea for a, a series or a service doesn't work or a detail is missed on him, a building. It's embarrassing. It's sad, but it's not a catastrophe. Mistakes happen. Not every plan works. And in our culture as a church, we don't try to hide mistakes. We acknowledge them openly. We get up and say, well, that didn't work. We won't do that again. Time for a new plan. Back to the drawing board. The goal was right. The execution was wrong. And we go on. We try again. It's, it's not as easy when life plans don't work out. When everything you thought could be, should be, and would be, isn't, won't be, and doesn't look like it ever will be. As a kid or a student, you kind of imagine what life is going to be like. Even if you aren't a planner, you, you map out your future in a general way. What kind of job you'll have, how much money you'll make. I've never heard a kid say, you know, I want to I grow up and I want to be pretty poor just want to kind of barely get by. No, you're, you dream of lots and extra. You dream about whether or not you'll be married and how many kids you'll have, where you'll live, what you'll drive. You make plans. And your plans probably include things like the kind of impact you'll make on others, 
how much of a difference you're going to make, and things you're absolutely going to do, and some things you'll never do. You say things like, I will never be like my father. I'll never be an addict. I'll never overdose. I'll never be divorced. I'll never cheat on my spouse. There's no way I'll never ever be homeless. I'll never go to prison. One of life's biggest challenges is how you handle it and what you do when your plans don't work out. When you aren't where you thought you'd be, you're not doing what you thought you would do. It's difficult to move forward when what you plan to be and everything seems now to be everything you plan not to be. When plans don't work out, people lose heart. They walk away from God. They walk away from church. They walk away from people who love them and have their best interests at heart. Often they even blame God. It's God's fault not that their plans didn't work. Others who've never even been part of a church or had God in their life, they don't understand why. Why they hurt, why they fail, why their plans didn't and don't work out. Nobody plans to be a failure. You don't get married planning to be divorced. You don't plan to be an addict. You don't plan to be bitter and angry. No one plans that. You don't plan to fail a class and lose your scholarship. You don't plan to get cancer. You don't plan to be alone. You don't plan for your kids to be messed up. You don't plan to be disappointed. You don't plan for your plans to fail. No one does. That's where the Israelites found themselves in the passage we look at today. Let me set it up for you. The Israelites lost a battle. They suffered many losses. The survivors were captured by King Nebuchadnezzar and taken from Jerusalem to Babylon. They were defeated, discouraged, and disappointed. Nothing they planned was working out. It was a sad group of people. God gave them the promised land. Now the land promised to them was in the hands of an enemy. They weren't free and living in God's blessings. They were captured slaves in another country. They were political prisoners held by a cruel enemy who had no plan to ever let them return to their country. To make it even worse, the reason God allowed them to be captured is because they were disobedient. The Israelites knew God. They knew God's power. They weren't ignorant about his laws and his plan, but they decided to do their own thing. They disobeyed God by worshiping idols. They made deals with the enemy. They made pacts with kings and kingdoms to ensure their safety instead of trusting God to protect them. The Israelites were warned by prophets multiple times. They ignored them all, and they kept doing their own thing. And their plan didn't work out because it was precisely that. It was their plan, not God's plan. And finally, God decided, okay, if you want to do it your way, go ahead. I will remove my hand of blessing and protection. I will let you experience the consequences of following your plan instead of my plan. You might be in a similar situation. You knew right, but you didn't do right. You ignored all the warnings and decided on your plan instead of God's plan. And now you realize all my choices and decisions have led me to a place where I'm not anywhere near where God wants me to be. My plan ended up in something I never planned. That's where the Israelites were. They realized this is an epic failure. Our plan didn't work out at all. We sure wish we'd listen to God. And they wondered, is there any way back? Are we going to be captives forever? Is there any hope? Is there still place for us in God's plan? And you might wonder the same thing. I, I'm so far off. Have I gone too far? Is there a way back? Is there any hope? Is there still a place for me in God's plan? Is it even possible that God has a plan for my life after all this? The Israelites were hopeless, hopeless, helpless, powerless, and defeated. Their plan led to, to this. And then the Israelites got a letter 
And you say, all right, this is about to get encouraging. Not so fast. They weren't very excited when they heard it was from a prophet named Jeremiah. Jeremiah's nickname was the weeping prophet. He was a gloomy guy who didn't usually have encouraging things to say. He was not the guy you wanted to get a letter from when you were captive. And like most of Jeremiah's words, this letter doesn't start out very happy. Verse 10 of Jeremiah 29, Jeremiah writes, This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon. And right there, they're like, whoa, wait a second, 70 years? What's going on? In 70 years, at least three generations of Israelites will be born. Some of the people reading the letter will be dead and gone. 70 years? They were going to be captive for 70 years? And you read that and you think, oh, does that mean this is going to go on my life for 70 years? Is that the price for disobedience? I won't even be alive. There's no hope in that. Why 70 years? The Bible doesn't make that clear. But the Israelites were being judged for long-term generational disobedience. And that warranted a long-term punishment. Maybe that's how long it was going to take for the Israelites to decide their plan was foolish. Maybe that's how long it'd take for them to decide that the only right path was to trust and rely on God. Maybe that's how long it took for them to come to their senses. I've got some advice for you. All right, everybody can tune back in. Look at me. Don't wait 70 years. Don't wait seven years. Don't wait seven days. If your plan hasn't worked to this point, it's not going to all of a sudden start working. Your plan will only get you deeper and deeper into the mass. Decide right now before I even finish this sentence. God, I'm ready. I, I'm ready right now. I'm ready for your plan. My plan failed. I need your plan. Jeremiah went on. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. Okay, this is a little more encouraging. God was saying, when the 70 years are up, it's going to be a long time. It's going to be 70 years. But when they're up, your time in captivity will be over and you're going to return to Jerusalem. Now, if you've been in church a long time, this next verse, the promise we look at today is a familiar one. We're learning God's promises this year. When you leave today, the ushers will have a card for you with this verse on it. You may have heard it before, it's, but it's probably not one you've studied in context. If you aren't a church person and you're suffering from following your own plan, this is going to be your favorite promise. Here it is. Jeremiah 29, 11. It starts with these words. I know the plans I have for you. Now, there's two great things right there. Number one, first, God still has a plan for you. No matter how far you've wandered off course, no matter how much you've disobeyed, no matter how screwed up your life, no matter how many bad decisions you've made, God still has a plan for your life. Here's the second thing we see there. God knows the plan. See, God's not making it up as he goes along. God has always had a plan. God will always have a plan. The moment you decide, I'm ready, God doesn't have a huddle in heaven trying to figure out what to do. He already has a plan in place for you. So let's back up a little. What is it that takes you away from God's plan in the first place? Well, it's the same thing that took the Israelites away. Sin. You know what's right, but you choose to do wrong. You choose to violate God's words and God's instructions off plan. Second, disobedience. With sin, you do wrong. With disobedience, you don't do right. You know the right thing to do. You just don't do it. And then you act surprised when you find yourself experiencing consequences. Well, if you disobey God's instructions regarding finances, expect consequences. Expect things not to go right in that part of your life. If you disobey God's instruction regarding relationships, expect unhealthy, dysfunctional relationships. If you disobey God's instructions regarding habits, expect consequences. If you disobey God's instructions about conflict resolution, guess what? Your conflicts aren't going to be resolved. 
There's going to be consequences. There is a clear pattern in Scripture. Sin and disobedience always leads to captivity. Always. Now, I'm not saying you're going to be captured by enemies, but you will be controlled by something other than yourself. I think every addict or ex-addict here understands what it means to be captive. Come on. They're ruled by the desire for the next drink or the next pill or the next fix. They are captive to that desire. Some of you are captive to debt. Debt owns you. Some of you are held captive by an attitude or a way of thinking. Satan's agenda for you is to be trapped, to be held captive by sin. He does not want you to experience the freedom God has for you. Another thing that takes you away from God's plan is self-reliance. The Israelites decided great and mighty Israel could handle things on their own. They didn't need God. When you rely on yourself instead of God, you get off plan. You will never accomplish God's plan in your power. You get away from God's plan when you go to the wrong people. The Israelites listened to other kings and advisors whose advice led them to defeat. Students, that's why your parents, your pastors are so concerned about the people in your life, the people you hang out with, your, your best friends. My dad quoted this scripture to me so many times growing up. Apostle, Apostle Paul wrote, bad company corrupts good morals. And he was right. You get away from God's plan when you listen to the wrong people and when you ignore the right people. The Israelites had multiple warning from God's prophets and they ignored them all. When you ignore warnings and instructions from people who love you and have your best interests at heart, you are headed off God's plan. You can count on it. Consequences are coming. We're just like the Israelites, aren't we? We do what we want, when we want, with who we want, and then we're surprised when things don't work out. But being disciplined by God is not being abandoned by God. Even in the middle of all the mess, God said, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. And what you expect God to say is, I know the plans I have for you. I have a plan for you to be miserable because you are miserable, disobedient, stubborn, foolish, and a know-it-all. Here's my plan for you. Nothing. I have no plan for you. You ignored me. You disobeyed me. Why would I have a plan for you? That's not what God said. God said, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Now, isn't that an awesome promise? See, it means even more when you understand the context. This is so often out of context. The situation is, this is what God said to a foolish, disobedient people who were far from his plan. God said, I still have a plan for you. This season in your life is not going to last forever. You're going to be free. You're going to be delivered. I'm still here. Even in the middle of difficulty, God still has a plan for you. Now, that doesn't mean your life will be only be filled with good things. Your life may be challenging and tough. You might be going through an extremely difficult season, but God is good, and God will never abandon you. He's on your side. Difficulty is not a sign that God is lost or confused, or that God's plan is over. God's plan is to prosper you. Now, you're all like, sign me up for that new Corvette. <laughs> I want to take a moment, I want to help you with that word. That's been taken to mean God has a plan to make me rich. People claim this promise to mean big homes, fancy cars, lavish vacations, private jets, and shopping sprees. But the word God used here wasn't so much talking about money and possessions. The word interpreted by our interpreters as prosper is the Hebrew word shalom, which is the word for peace. Shalom is being at rest in peace in the middle of adversity. Shalom is God with you in times of trouble. Shalom is well-being and satisfaction. So you can read the verse more accurately this way. I have a plan to be with you, to give you peace, to take care of you, and to watch out for you. Now, isn't that better than a Corvette? Some of you are like, I'm not so sure about that. 
God isn't looking to punish you for the rest of your life or make you miserable for your disobedience. God's plan is to take care of you, not to harm you. But that's not all. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope. God says my plan includes hope for you. Here's my definition of hope. I think you'll like it. Hope is anticipation of a better tomorrow. God says better days are coming. Better days are ahead. The end is in sight. You won't always be in this condition because of my plan has hope. Now listen to me. If you're currently way out of God's plan, he still has a plan for you. Not to harm you, but to take care of you. If you've been despondent and you feel like there's no way out and you have no chance, get your hopes up. Things are going to get better. God gives hope. I read a story about hope. I want to share it with you. The school system in a large city had a program to help children keep up with their schoolwork during days in the city's hospitals. One day, a teacher who was assigned to the program received a call asking her to visit a child. She took the child's name and room number, talked briefly with the child's regular class teacher. We're studying nouns and adverbs in his class, the regular teacher said. I'd be grateful if you could help him understand them so he won't get too far behind. The hospital program teacher went to see the boy that afternoon. No one had mentioned her. The boy had been badly burned and was in great pain. Upset at the sight of the boy, she stammered as she told him, I've been sent by your school to help you with nouns and adverbs. When she left, she felt like she hadn't accomplished much. But the next day, when she came, a nurse asked her, what did you do to that boy? The teacher thought she'd done something wrong. She began to apologize. No, no, said the nurse, you don't know what I mean. We've been worried about him, but ever since yesterday, his attitude changed. He's fighting back. He's responding to treatment. It's as though he's decided to live. Two weeks later, the boy explained he'd completely given up hope till the teacher arrived. Everything changed when he came to a simple realization. He expressed it this way. They wouldn't send a teacher to work on nouns and adverbs with a dying boy, would they? You've got hope. I find it fascinating that people focus on the plan part and the prosper hope, but they miss the hope in the future. There is little more powerful than the power of hope. If, if there's no God in your life, there is no hope. What hope can there possibly be without him? But with God, you can be full of hope. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. You can't just skip that last part because for the Israelites, that was a key part of the promise. In captivity, it didn't look like there was a future. They'd missed it. God's plan for Israel was over. The nation would cease to exist. And then Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, came along. He wrote a letter and said, I got a word from God. You've got a future. It's not over. There's hope. God still has a future for you. Listen to me. God not only gives you hope, you have a future. You can still be and do everything that God has planned for you to be and do. His plan is not just to rescue you from your current situation. That'd be enough. But his plan is for you to make a difference. His plan for you is to be used by him. God's got plans for you that go far beyond you. He's got a plan for your future. It's not over, even though it might look and feel over. You have a future that is greater than your past. Your future is greater than your present. God has good plans for you that include a future. Listen to me. You can't give up now. You can't quit now because God's got a miracle for you right around the corner. God's got something that's going to happen in your life. You've got a future. And even if you've wandered away from God's plan, this promise says, I have a plan for you. I still have a plan for you. I have always loved you. And I will always love you. I have seen your tears. And I know your fears. And I 
still love you in this quiet day once again I'll remind you that I still love you it doesn't matter what you've done or if you're it doesn't matter if you run, my light's still shining, and I've carved you with my hand, I understand why you would question me. you to listen to that promise one more time. If things look done and you're not sure where to turn, if it feels like you've messed your way up following your plan and there's no way to get back on track, here's what God says to you. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in the future. God has a good plan for you. Would you bow your heads with me? And I want to pray for you today. If, if you feel like you're off plan and, and you know it and you never thought you'd be here now in this spot and you just wonder is there any way back? Or maybe circumstances have happened and all of a sudden you're facing something in your life that you never planned for and you never counted on and, and you're just saying, God, I need you. Where are you? I want to pray for you. If that's you, would you stand right where you're at and we're going to pray. Say, what are people going to think? Well, they're going to think you're off plan. That's what we just said. If you're watching online, I want you to hit the button for prayer at the bottom of your screen. We're going to pray for you. We're going to pray with you. We're, there are people there right now ready to pray for you. Before we pray, one more time, i got to read it to you. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. If somebody near you is standing, would you stand with them? Put your hand on their shoulder, or if you know them, put your arm around them. Introduce yourself if you've, if you've never met them. We're going to pray. Here's one of the things that happens when you're off plan, is you think that everyone's evaluating you based on that. And that because you feel off plan, you think everybody's saying, oh, look at him. No, we're not. Because we've been there too. We've messed up and we've made mistakes or circumstances have happened. We found ourselves where we never thought we'd be. And we held to this same promise that you're going to hold to today. Now the people standing with you are going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you too. Come on, let's pray. Lord, we find ourselves today. We stand or we push a button on a screen to just say, I didn't think I'd be here. Lord, it this is not what we thought would be or could be or should be under any circumstance. But now this is where we are. And so we stand in your presence very honestly, Lord. Just saying, we're off plan, we're off course, and we desperately need you. We need your help. 
Lord, I pray for people who the reason they're off plan is because of their own sin and disobedience, because they followed their own plan instead of your plan. Lord, I pray right now that you would lovingly bring them back. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for grace. Thank you, Lord, that you don't give up on us. Thank you, like we just sang, that you still love us. Lord, we ask for forgiveness right now, and we put our hope in this promise that you still have a plan for us and a plan for our future. And would you awaken hope in the hearts of some people in this room and some people watching online. Hope for today. Hope for tomorrow. Hope for the future. That life is not over because you still have a plan. Lord, I pray for people whose circumstances have brought them to a spot they never thought they'd be, and they feel defeated, and they don't know what to do or where to turn or what's going to happen. Would you encourage them right now, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit? I pray, Lord, that you would get involved in their situation and that your plan would begin to trump the plan of others and trump the plan of the enemy that has them in this place. Lord, we speak your word today and we declare this promise for our lives and for our friends. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Lord, we pray that that future would start now, that we wouldn't have to wait 70 years or seven days, but your plan would start right now. And so we commit ourselves We commit ourselves to follow you. We commit ourselves to obey your instructions. Lord, we commit ourselves. Your plan is better than our plan. And we follow you in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Come on, in your own way, would you just thank him? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you still have a plan for us. Thank you, Jesus, that you don't give up on us. Thank you, Jesus, that you're involved. Thank you, Jesus, that you still love us, that you still care for us. Thank you, Jesus, for that hope and for that future. Thank you, Jesus. 